Hello, it's Vitlin Naku from SoftUni, the software university. Today, together with my colleague George Gurgiev, we shall continue teaching this free Java Foundations course, which covers important concepts from Java programming, such as arrays, lists, methods, strings, classes, objects, and exceptions, and prepares you for the Java Foundations official exam from Oracle. In this lesson, your instructor George will explain and demonstrate how to work with arrays, reading arrays from the console, processing arrays using the for each loop, printing arrays and simple array algorithms. You will learn how to declare and allocate an array of certain length, two ways to read an array from the console, how to traverse and print array elements from our existing array, and how to access an element by index, and how to modify an element at certain index. Along with the live coding examples, the instructor George will give you some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience with arrays and other mentioned coding concepts. Let's start learning arrays. Before we dive into the course, I want to show you the soft unit JIT system, where you can get instant feedback for your exercise solutions. Soft unit JIT is an automated system for code evaluation. You just send your code for a certain coding problem and the system will tell you whether your solution is correct or not and what exactly is missing or wrong. I'm sure you will love the judge system once you start using it. Let me show you how you can submit the solutions from your hands-on practical exercises to the automated grading system, the so-called soft unit judge. So you have a judging system designed to send you your code and it tells you whether the code is correct or not. And I will show you how it works. You open this link and you go on this, uh, on this uh, website where is in the software you judge and you click, click practice and you have this full Java full foundation course. These are the, the problems. And here you, you put your code just like it's shown here and you submit and you send it so for example let's the first problem student information is this one and this is your solution in java and you want to check whether your solution is correct or not you click submit and it appears here so you can refresh in a few moments and it tells you whether your code is correct or not if you put some incorrect code for example uh, I will format incorrectly the age and the grades of, 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 the, uh, of the output. And when I click here, it tells me that I have all the tests wrong. And in this case, I can click the details and I can see that it, the expected input is like this. Uh, the, and my output is this one at, at the right. I have one additional digit which is which should not be there. So this is how the judge system works. It will be your best friend when you are learning uh, Java through our tr training courses because uh, as I repeat many times, uh, learning Java is mostly coding and less watching videos so you need to practice that's why we have prepared a lot of coding exercises for you and please do them because i want you to become java developers before the start i would like to introduce your course instructors svetlin nakov and george Gurgiev, who are experienced java developers senior software engineers and inspirational tech trainers they have spent thousands of hours teaching programming and software technologies and are top trainers from SoftUni. I'm sure you will like how they teach programming. Hello everyone, this is George, I'm your technical trainer and today we're going to be talking about the race in this lesson. And this lesson will actually complete our knowledge base for writing complete computer programs. I was going to say Turing complete, but we'll need to explain that in a bit. So up until this point, we were writing programs with one very important component missing. And today we will see how we can use that component to our advantage. And we will learn all the power that comes with using arrays. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, arrays is our main subject. We'll talk about what they are, how we can create them, how we can use them, how we can read them from the console and 
of course write them to the console meaning how we can do input and output of arrays from the console then we'll talk about stuff like uh, string dot split we'll talk about uh, using a for loop to read the arrays we'll, we'll talk about printing them with loops and we'll talk about printing them with uh, standard uh, functions like string dot join and we'll figure all that out and then we'll talk about the for each loop which we haven't yet encountered up, to, up until now we'll see how that works we'll see what we can do with it and we'll have some fun with these new with this new concept which will complete our knowledge base for writing uh, fully featured programs. Now I'm repeating this uh, concept of writing fully featured programs and uh, accessing um, uh, accessing the full potential of programming, but what do, I, what do I actually mean by that? Well, up until this point, we were creating programs which had branching. So our programs had branching of logic. So we could split our code execution into two parts. And we also had uh, a random number of repetitions of some piece of our code. So we could branch our code and we could repeat our code a number of times that was determined, for example, from the input from the console. However, we're missing a, a pretty important part of all of this. So we could, in order to write complete computer programs. Now each computer program, each, each complete uh, set of instructions and computer uh, supports needs to have branching, needs to have repetition of code a number of times, which isn't determined compile time, meaning that, for example, you read an, uh, an integer from the console and that determines how many times you repeat some piece of code or other conditions determine it. So those are two important things, but there's a third thing. And the third thing is allocating memory and more precisely, more precisely allocating memory dynamically. The, uh, our current access to memory is always, has always been through variables of primitive data types. And these primitive data types, although they do initialize memory, the amount of memory that the program needs is known compile time. We know what number of uh, what methods we have, and these uh, methods have variables in them, and these variables allocate memory. However, we have no option of allocating um, a random amount of memory uh, during our execution of the program. So during, while the program executes, we're basically working with what we've coded into it um, from the start as memory. So however many variables we have created, well, we have that many uh, bytes of memory depending on, of course, uh, the sizes of our variables. So uh, th there's a strict correlation between them. But very often, uh, a program will need to increase the memory it uses based on user input or other conditions it encounters. So often you will have, um, you, you will have code that needs to allocate additional memory. And we're missing this part. We, we can't yet do this. So let's learn how to do it. And arrays will, will allow us to do exactly that. Now to illustrate the problem, let's uh, do a, a demo. So let's say we have a task in which we have to read integers from the console. Let's say we have numbers like so. So we have four, five, one, three, seven. And our task is to reverse these numbers and print them in reverse order. Or, and even, let's not keep them on the same line. Let's have them on separate lines. We want these numbers on separate, separate lines. We want them en entered and let's have an initial number which tells us how many of these numbers there are. So in this case we have five numbers so this will be the number five. And let's make this one 42 so it's uh, a bit easier to see where the numbers start and which is which part of the input is the number of numbers and which are the, the actual numbers. So let's change them to 42, 15, uh, 31 and 7 for example. So these are our numbers and we need to reverse them. So we have an initial count of these numbers and we have the numbers as a sequence and we need to reverse that sequence of numbers. Now how would we do that? Well, let's say there are a fixed uh, amount of numbers. So um, we have, um, like in a previous lesson, there was a task where there were three characters entered on the console, each on separate lines, and then we had to reverse these characters. And that was pretty much easy because we already knew the amount of uh, characters on the consoles because we, we already knew there were all, always going to be three so three lines of input in our case 
We don't know that. We are told the number of inputs on the first line of the console. So, but but let's let's say we we want to solve the task for the uh, example of five elements. How would we do that? Well, um, if we don't know how to dynamically allocate memory, what we are forced to do is just create the variables which represent uh, the input which we got. So we have something like int number zero, because programmers count from zero, you will see why I uh, count them from zero. And then we'll have int number one, and then we'll have int number two, and then we'll have int number three, and then we'll have int number four. That's all of the numbers, right? Those are five numbers, just like in this case. Five numbers counting from zero, that gives us a minimum index, let's call that an index, of zero and a maximum index of four for five elements. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, we're going to need a scanner. So let's create a new scanner that reads from system.in and we'll initialize that and put it into a variable and that variable we will call scanner and how do we read from that scanner now well i just say number zero equals scanner dot next int and continue on reading like that until i reach the end of my variables and i'm limited by exactly that i'm limited by the amount of my variables now we could play along a bit here and uh, uh, write some conditional statements like uh, if uh, there are only two elements, we can only input these two. And then if there are three elements, we can input these three. And if there are four, four elements, we can input these four and so on. And that would be a, a pretty, that would be pretty ugly code, but it could work if we initialize all of these numbers. So let's, re so let's reverse them after we've read them from the console, let's reverse them. So how would we reverse them? Well, we'd say system.out dot print let's print them on the same line with spaces so system dot out dot print number zero with a space after it and then system dot out dot print number one with the space after it then system dot out dot print number two with the space after it and so on for number three and so on for number four okay and again we could do this with ifs so we could we actually need to read our size first in um size let's let's just call it size the number of numbers or sequence size or something okay so this is scanner dot next int also because we need to read this size variable at the start and then read our numbers and then print them out now of course this code has a problem the problem being that uh, we can't actually work with this size we have we are still allocating all of the variables we need uh, for reversing the data so we have a problem. We we, <clears throat> we we have a dynamic amount of memory we need to allocate because it is determined at runtime. So it's not a compile time determination of memory which we uh, use during uh, which we determine during writing the code. It's a runtime determination of memory which comes just like uh, any other. A condition that can occur during our prog program. In this case, it comes uh, in the form of user input, user input from the console. So we can't know what input the user will uh, add here. So we can't know how many variables to initialize. Now, uh, in most programming tasks, you would know what the maximum value is. And I guess you could do something like initialize all possible numbers let's say the you know that the maximum value will be 100 what do you do well you keep initializing numbers like this until you reach 100 so you'd have a lot of numbers and then number 100 and then you'd read uh, you, you'd have an if before each next int reading and whether uh, and based on how many uh, numbers there were entered in the uh, initial input well then you'd do uh, conditional checks which uh, you know compare exactly with that uh, amount of numbers so you would do okay so how many um, if, if your size is one you would be reading just this number if your size is two you would be reading this number and then you would be reading this number if your size is three you would be reading the first two and then be reading the third number but won't be reading the fourth number and so on so you you, you get the idea we would uh, have numbers read uh, one after the other 
and we'd have ifs before reading each number. Now, obviously, this is very non-optimal, um, even if we could do it, and we can't really do it because uh, we don't know how many numbers there are going to be uh, as a max value. Yeah, I, I just said if the max value was 100, okay, we could probably write them all. But if there were 4 billion or even larger, well, we can't do that. We, we can't do it at least uh, in a reasonable amount of time and coding would be a nightmare if you had to do it like that. Okay, so what do we do in that case? Well, uh, most programming languages give you one, uh, one or another method of allocating dynamic memory. So allocating memory, which is not known compile time, but is known runtime. So what do I mean by that? Instead of uh, initializing a fixed number of variables, what we do is initialize an array. Arrays allow us to initialize dynamic amounts of memory. So instead of having number 0, number 1, number 2, number 3, and so on, what we would have is after reading our size, after we know how many elements we need, we would create a so-called array. How are arrays created? Well, arrays contain elements, just like this sequence of variables contains elements. It contains the number 0, and number 1, and number 2, and number 3, and so on. Okay, so it arrays contain elements and those elements have some type so uh, if we want if we want to read numbers well we want to uh, create an integer array and how do we create an integer array we begin with saying integer it's pretty much the same as creating any variable however because we don't want a single integer we want a certain amount of integers determined by the input we place brackets over here. So what this tells Java is this isn't a single variable, meaning that it, it's actually it's not a single piece of data, it's multiple pieces of data. So this int array can contain multiple pieces of data and we'll call it numbers. So up until this point, it's pretty much the same as initializing a variable, only you need to add these square brackets. Okay, so we have the numbers and then we say these numbers are equal to a new just like we used new for initializing big decimal and uh, big integer or string and so on. The same way we use new to initialize an array. And now here we say new int because we're having an int array, an integer array. We say new int and what Java wants to know is how many ints. So it sees this is an array and it needs to know how many ints we want to initialize. Okay, so how, them, how many ints do we want to initialize? Well, we want to initialize a size number of ints. So whatever input, uh, whatever the input was stored in size, we need to initialize that number of integers. Okay, so this creates a so-called array, and that array contains this amount of elements, meaning that this line of code initializes as many ints as there is size entered here. So if we got six for size, then this will create six integers in memory. If we got two in size, it will create two integers in memory and so on. Okay, and numbers points to that memory. So numbers is the variable which contains the array. So this is the array and we are saving it into this variable. Okay, so how do we use that numbers uh, array? Well, we could do the same like we did here, although it wouldn't be uh, initializing an int variable on each line. It would just be let's remove these, it would just be numbers and then to access an element of numbers we just open brackets and then write in the index we want to access. So just like we had number 0, number 1, number 2, number 3 and so on, we can do number 0, number 1, number 2, number 3, number 4 and so on. So this accesses the element at that position. So for five elements this would be the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the last element. Okay, and if we want to print them, what we can do is, again, access them by their index. So we don't say number, uh, number zero, number one directly, we place these brackets around the index we want to access. So these brackets are your multi-tool for arrays. You, initialize, you, you declare arrays with them, you define their size with them, 
and you access their elements with these brackets. <coughs> so this code, up until this point, is pretty much the equivalent of what we had for the variables. The only difference is that we're using a non-fixed number of elements for initialization. Okay, so now the next cool part is that we don't need to do it like this because this over here is just a variable, right? This, this is a value. This is the integer literal one, uh, inter integer literal zero. And this is the integer literal one, and this is two, and this is three, and this is four. Wherever we can place a literal, we can place a what? We can place a variable, correct? Okay, so how can we walk through all of these numbers over here and instead of uh, typing in manually based on the size, uh, instead of typing in manually, how can we do this automatically? Well, we're repeating the same piece of code, right? We're repeating the access to the uh, element, the reading from the console. So we're repeating code. This code executes and it should execute this amount of times, a size amount of times, correct? Okay. And the only thing that changes is the index over here. Well, guess what can start from an index and reach another index and repeat a piece of code by supplying it the, its index? Well, that's the for loop or one of the other loops. So what we do is just say, create a for loop starting from zero and continuing up to, now we could use size, but since we've initialized an array already and arrays in Java know their size, we can directly access the size of the array. So we can say numbers and um, from here on out to access something of an object like numbers, the same way we to access next in from a scanner, we use a dot. Well, in the same way we use numbers dot to access its length because length and size are both members of uh, in, the, in this case, scanner, and in our case, the numbers array. Okay, so length is just the amount of items there are in this numbers array. So now we start a for loop, and that for loop will start from zero and continue until there are numbers. Okay, until its index reaches the maximum index of numbers, which in this input example over here is four because there are five elements and counting from zero that gives us the maximum index of four and now instead of writing each of these lines uh, on our own we can just say numbers at position i assign that to the next integer from the console and this will execute these operations for us so we will run a for loop and this will execute these assignment operations for us okay so that works uh, we just assign uh, values to a numbers array and uh, we can now use the values from this numbers array. And guess what? We can also print the same way. So we read like this and to write, what do we need to do? Well, we need to start another for loop, but we instead of starting it from zero, because we want it to print in reverse, remember, we want them printed in reverse. Okay. so. Uh, starting instead of from zero, we want to print the items of the numbers array in reverse, meaning we need to start from the last item. Okay, so which is the last item? Well, we already said that for five items, the last item is at index four. So this would be index four, but how would we calculate index four in another way? So for five items, it's index four. So for length items, like we have here, for the number of items, we have length minus one because five minus one is four. So length minus one is the last index in an array. Okay. And uh, what is our check? Well, we need to start from the last number and continue up until the first number. So we're going to be going in reverse, meaning we're not going to be increasing i, we're going to be decreasing it. And we're not going to uh, be checking whether it's smaller than something, we're going to be checking whether it's greater than or equal to something. And that something, that last item we're visiting, is zero, correct? The index zero is the first index in an array. Okay, just like index zero is the first index in a string, by the way, that's why when you say char at zero, it returns the first character in a string. So that's where that, that's where that comes from. Okay, so we got that. Uh, and now what, what do we need to do? Well, here's what we were doing previously. And now it's the same code, only that we don't print the element at index zero, we print the element at index i, whatever i is. 
Okay, so what did we get just now? Where we have a very small co program in comparison, which can work with any size we enter, regardless of what that size is, as long as we have enough RAM uh, memory to uh, store uh, an array that big. Okay, we have that, and then we just have four, two for loops, which iterate based on the length of that array. So not only did we solve our problem, we also are able to use the variables, uh, the, the variable size of that dynamic memory and start for loops based on it. We don't need to repeat code uh, for each index. We just submit that into a for loop and only change the index we're accessing. So in addition to allowing us dynamic memory allocation, arrays allow us uh, dynamic access to elements. So in this way, we don't have a fixed number of variables we can access. We have a dynamic number of variables determined by the input. Okay, so we have this. Let's see if it works. So um, we're printing the numbers. Okay, let's get this input. How can we get it? I'll hold down Alt and I'll mark vertically like this. Okay, copying this and starting the program. Let's see what we, what we got here. Okay, so the program is now running. Let's add our input to it. So five items, 42, 15, 1, 31, 7, and we expect them ordered in reverse. And that's what we got. 7, 31, 1, 15, 42, the five items. We don't have a new line at the end, but that's not a big deal. We can always add it over here. We can always add it at this part uh, of the code. Okay, so this thing worked. Great. Let's, uh, let's see from what we can do with arrays from here on out. So this is what an array is. An array is just a normal variable which stores multiple data points, multiple parts of information. You can think of it like storing multiple variables inside a single variable and having the option to access them programmatically, meaning that you don't need to know their names. Their names are just form formed by the name of the array plus the index at which the, that element is located. And other than that, the, ax, the reading and writing of these elements is the same as using any normal variables. Uh, if the variable was called numbers i or numbers one or whatever, it would be accessed and uh, write, written to the console, read from the console in the same way that uh, any other variable can be. So each of the variables here, here inside the numbers array are just normal variables which you can work with like any other variable. Okay, so these variables here are called elements. So an array contains elements and these elements have indices. An index is just the position of that element in the array in relation to the other elements. So you have the element at position zero, you have the element at position one, you have the element at position two and so on. Arrays are continuous pieces of memory, meaning that you have your RAM memory over here and you have an array, in our case our array numbers, and that simply points to a place in memory where the array starts. And you have the item, uh, the element zero over here, and then you have the element one over here, and then you have the element two over here, and then you have the element three over here, and the element four over here. For a five item array of numbers, that's what you have in memory. So each of this, each of these, since numbers was an integer array, each of these is four bytes. So this is four bytes, this is four bytes, this is four bytes, this is four bytes, and this is four bytes. So for a five item array, th this is a sequence of five times um, four consecutive bytes in memory, meaning 20 bytes in memory for this whole entire array. And these bytes are consecutive. That's very important for arrays. That's why arrays can work the way they do by accessing elements, because they know that their items are always sequential. That's, by the way, the reason they start from zero, because numbers points to the first position and to get to, the, to, to get to any position, you need to offset from where numbers point. And how much do you offset? Well, if you want to offset to the first position, you need to move four bytes to the right. And if you want to go to the zero position, well, you move no bytes to the right because numbers point to the first position. Okay, so that's what an array is. An array is just a sequence of integers in memory, which we access programmatically using an index. 
Okay, and let's go back to the lecture and start uh, examining them in more formal details. So an array is a sequence of elements. It typically looks, it, it is typically illustrated like uh, somewhat of uh, a sequence of uh, squares which are numbered uh, within the sys from 0 to the length of the array to the number of elements minus 1. Okay, so this is an array of five elements and arrays have a fixed size. You can't change the size of an array. Once an array is created, it will always be that size. You can change the what the variable points to because the variable is just a container for the array, meaning that this is the array and this is a variable that happens to point to this array at this point in time. Later on, we can just say that numbers is something different. So we can say numbers is now a new integer array uh, of three elements and this would forget the old elements so numbers will start pointing to a new new array the old array will uh, be detached from this numbers variable and it will uh, drift along and be removed from memory at some point when the java runtime decides that we're not using it anymore and numbers will be pointing to a new array so we're not here we're not resizing the original array we're just forgetting about it and using another one we're making numbers point to a new array. Okay, uh, elements in an array are always of the same type. For example, you can have a, an array of strings, an array of characters. A string, by the way, is an array of characters. Uh, you can have an array of doubles, you can have an array of integers, but they all need to be of the same type. This thing over here is what you call the element index, and the indexes start from zero and end at length minus one, length of the array minus one. Okay, so how do you create an array? We already saw some parts of this, but let's uh, play around with uh, arrays a little bit more uh, on the more formal side. So how do you create an array? You name the data type of the array, the, the data type of the elements which will be contained in this array. And then let's say that data type is integer. And then you write brackets a closed pair of brackets, square brackets, and then you type in the name of the variable in which you want to store the array. So let's call this again numbers. Okay, and then you need to initialize it, you need to create an array, you need to dynamically allocate memory for an array. So you say new integer, and then you say how large this array needs to be. So there are a few ways you can do this. First off, you can just say, create me uh, an array of three elements. Okay, so now you have an array of three elements and you can start accessing the elements by just mentioning their index. So saying numbers, then opening these brackets, which I said are your multi-tool, any operation you're doing on an array is probably going to involve them. Okay, so numbers and accessing the element at index zero is done like so. You open the square brackets, you mention the index you want, in this case zero, and then you can assign a value to this. So you can say numbers at position zero equals 42, and numbers at position one equals 13, and numbers at position two equals 255. Now, the same way you assign them, the same way you print them. So the same way you get access to an element for assignment, you use the absolute same syntax to get access to an element for printing. So what, what I do here, I'd say system.out.println and I'd access numbers at position zero. So this would print the first element. And if I start this piece of code, numbers will get initialized with 42, 13 and 55 as its three elements, and then we'll print 42 on the console. Okay, now what else can I do? Well, what happens if I don't initialize number zero? So I created an array, it has three elements, I initialize numbers one and numbers two, but number zero has never been initialized. What would happen, what would uh, come out on the console for things that I haven't initialized? Well, the answer for integer is zero. Why did I get zero? Maybe because the index is zero? Well, no, it's not that. Let's uh, misinitializing another number, so let's say that number 0 is after all 42, and let's skip numbers 1, and let's print that one out and see what uh, gets printed on the console. Well, again, we will have 0 printed on the console. Okay, so it's not the index. How, do, how does Java decide that this should be 0? Well, 
if you remember the lesson about data types, you will recall that there we had a thing called a default value for data types. So for integer, that default value was zero. And for floating point numbers, that default value was 0, 0.0. And for characters, that was um, the zero character slash zero, otherwise uh, named slash zero or the no terminator. Uh, and if you remember strings, the value for string was what? The value for strings, the default value for a string was no, meaning that you, if you have an array, the, value, the values of the strings in that array um, will be no's until you initialize them. That's the no value. No just means a lack of value. Okay, we'll get to that in a bit, but this is how you can initialize values in an array. So let's get back to initializing all of our items and see how we can uh, use a shorthand for that. So <clears throat> we're saying numbers one is now initialized by um, the value 13, like it was before. And instead of writing this uh, down, when you know what your elements will be, like in this case, in this case, we know what our elements will be, compile time or, or runtime. We know it compile time because we have initialized them specifically with the literal tree the literal we know compile time. I'm writing it right now. And the values, I also know compile time in this case. So when you know your values compile time, you can just do like so. You remove this size over here and then you place the items inside these curly brackets after the square brackets of the integer array. So you place 42, 13, 255 and you can press Control alt l to format the code so that uh, the spacing is uh, more uh, pleasant for the eye. And now we have the equivalent of initializing the numbers array like so. And if I print the first item, the item at index zero, I would get, uh, at index one, I would get 13 printed on the console. And here we go, we have 13 printed on the console. Okay, and again, I can iterate this array with a simple for loop. I can say for index starting from zero, continuing until we reach numbers dot length. And that would give us at each iteration, we'd have each index in the numbers array. Not that i is specifically tied to the numbers array, but since it's increasing from zero up until numbers dot length, at the first iteration, I will be zero, that the second iteration, I will be one, and at the third iteration, I will be two, meaning that we would access each of these elements, zero, one, and two, and we can do whatever we wish with them. Let's say we can print them on the console. <coughs> System.out.print, and let's print that number at that position. And, if, and we can add a space after it, and we can even add, after that printing, we can even add system.out dot print line, print an empty line so that the array uh, is represented on a single line on the console instead of uh, having something else after it. Okay, so starting this, we're going to see 42, 13 and 255 printed on the console with spaces. Okay, so that's one thing we can do with, uh, with arrays. What else can we do? Well, let's get back to the lecture. So this is a way of initializing a numbers array. And as I said, all elements in that array are going to be with, uh, going to contain the value zero initially, uh, if, that's an, if that's an array of integers. Now we can also initialize them by using these curly brackets as I demonstrated, and we can assign values through a for loop. Now, I already showed how we can assign values through reading from the console. This example here just assigns each index uh, each position to uh, the value one. So all of the elements in this numbers array are going to be the, the number one. So there are going to be 10 ones in our array of numbers. Okay, so length holds how many elements you've got in this array and this brackets operator accesses the element at that position. <clears throat> you can play around with the elements any way you want. You just need to mention the name of that element and the name of the element is just the combination of the name of the array and the index of the element placed in square brackets. Again, we did this a few times already, so I hope you already got the drift of what we're doing. Just It's just 10 integers, 10 integer variables, and the name of each variable is determined then by the numbers array and uh, an index, a number, which determines its place in that numbers array. Okay, now what happens if we access an element outside the numbers array? 
Meaning, what happens if we access index 10? Well, what's the maximum index for an array of 10 elements? It's 9, right? 10, 10 minus 1. The maximum index is always max index is always length minus 1. Okay, so what happens if we access position the position at length? So what, what happens if we say, give me index length? Give me the element at index length. Well, what happens is a so-called array index out of bounds exception, meaning your program crashes with an error message containing this inside it. We will explain exceptions in another lesson. But for now, all you need to know is that the program will crash. So you cannot access elements outside of your array. Same thing would happen if uh, you have a negative index, if you try to access index minus one. Okay, so that's an array. And that's how you access its elements. Now, let's uh, have an example of what we can do with the string uh, array. We can initialize a string array and place, for example, the days of the week there. And then we can have some code which uh, enters a day of the week and we print the name of that day of the week. So let's do that. Let's have uh, an array of strings, a string array, days, or even day names. And we'll initialize that with a new new string array, which contains the elements Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I won't be typing in all of them because it will take more time than it's necessary. Uh, these can be on a single line, they can be on multiple lines, they can have empty lines in between them, although I wouldn't suggest that. Uh, you can do any configuration of initializing them like this. The only thing you keep in mind is that when you're specifying the values at initialization like so, like literals, you have to omit the size of the array. Why? Well, because the size of the array is determined by how many items you add in. <coughs> okay, so what do we do from here on out? Well, we can... Uh, let's say we have a task in which we need to read a number from the console. That number will be a number between 1 and 7. That's important, between 1 and 7. Okay, let's add all of the days so, so we can uh, implement the task fully. So Thursday and, and Friday, Friday. I won't be singing because you will not want to watch anymore. Okay, so Saturday. There was a song about Saturday too and Sunday. There are a lot of songs about Sunday and on Sunday. Okay, anyway, so uh, we have our weekdays and we're going to have an input between 1 and 7 and we need to print the name of that day. So 1 will be Monday, 2 will be Tuesday and so on. So let's read that. Let's call the scanner and ask it for, an, for the next integer and say that this is the day number but not the day index because I'm saying the day number will be between 1 and 7, not between 0 and 6, right? So what do I need to print now? I need to say system.out.println and what would I be printing? I'd be printing day names and I'd access day number. Well, yeah, but someone, if someone inputs 1, I'd get Tuesday because this is index 0 and this is index 1 and this is index 2 and this is index 3 and so on and the last index is index what? Index 6. Okay, so if uh, we're going to get input which is in normal human numbering, starting from 1, we need to access the element 1 less than that. So if they enter day 1, we need to access day names 0. So starting this code, this would give us, um, an, uh, this would give us the name of that day which we've inputted. So if I input 4, I should get Thursday because Thursday is the fourth day of the week. So enter and I got Thursday on the output, exactly as I expected. Okay, so this is one way you can use an array to uh, index values, index some names and access them through a number. Okay, so we just uh, handled that and uh, here we have a problem which is exactly that, uh, that concept. One thing in addition, we have to print invalid day if we don't get a number between 1 and 7. So that would be just uh, an if condition that prints something else if the index is different than the range 1 through 7. Okay, so here's a solution which does that and again I suggest you uh, write that code yourself.
Okay, so let's do a reading of an array and then we'll do a break. A simple reading of an array. Now we already saw how we can read an array by knowing its length as input from the console because that's the first thing we did. The first thing we did was enter a number from the console and then initialize an array with that size. So how does that happen? Well, you read the number of items you're going to need. Then you initialize an array with that number of items. And then you start a for loop starting from zero and continuing to that number of items. Although here I prefer r dot length because I already know that this array is at most this number of elements and I don't need the n anymore. That way I'm reducing the uh, span of n because I'm not using it uh, as, well, I'm reducing the usages of n and I'm using only the array and its own sizes to determine the loop. But n is fine too. Okay, and then I just start an iteration which start, starts in at index zero, it accesses element zero and it reads it from the console. And then at index one, it accesses element one and reads that from the console. And then at index two, it accesses element two and reads that from the console and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's how you read an array from the console if you know the size, if the size has been entered on the console. But if you don't know the size, there are other ways to read an array from the console. So one of these ways is by reading an array from a single line on the console. And this is actually a pretty common uh, case when reading input from the console. Now, how do we know when to stop? Well, if we have a fixed size, we execute our loop that number of times. But if we don't have a fixed size, we need to have something else which indicates when we should stop. In this case, because this is a single line on the console, we know that that single line will end in the new line character. And do we have a function that reads uh, until it reaches the new line character? Well, yes, we do. And that function is called scanner.nextLine. So what we do now is we'd say scanner.nextLine. That will read us these symbols. So this will get us a string containing these symbols, only the symbols. Those symbols are not yet numbers. We don't have an array yet. We, have an, we actually have an array of characters because a string is just an array of characters. So this string line is just an array of characters, but they're still characters. They're not numbers separated into multi-character sequences which represent uh, integer values. Okay, so how do we get them uh, as such numbers? Well. Lucky us, the uh, string object, our line here, has a split function. What does the split function do? Well, you supply a separator by which you want to split. Actually, you supply a regular expression, which we will talk about in a further lesson, uh, by which you want to, to separate uh, your values. Now, if, we, if you just want to split by spaces or any other character, you just type in this character over here. Uh, and after you split on this character, split, well, guess what it returns? It doesn't know how many elements it's going to get, so it needs to count the elements, allocate a dynamic amount of memory, and place that, uh, those elements in that dynamic memory. Well, guess what it allocates? It allocates an array. So here are our elements. Okay, so what, how did we get them? We got them as strings. Why didn't it return it as numbers? Well, because it doesn't know if those are numbers. I could have entered something like hello world and read that from a single line of the console and that would actually be an array of strings. So uh, splitting a string just gives us the elements of strings and from there on out, we have to decide what to do with these elements as strings. Okay, so in our case, we have a string array of elements and we want to have an integer array of elements. Okay, so let's create an integer array of, let's call them numbers. How lo large is, going, is this array going to be? Well, it's going to be as large as elements. So I'd initialize it as a new integer array, which is as big as elements.length. Okay, and from here on out, we just need to copy the values from the indexes at elements into the indexes at numbers. So we have for example, if we entered 12, 42, 13, after splitting this single string into multiple strings, what we get is 12 as a string, then 42 as a string, and then 13 as a string. Okay, 
So this is an array of strings. This is the first string, this is the second string, this is the third string. So this is the string at index 0, this is the string at index 1, and this is the string at index 2. And now we want to have an array with 1, 2, 3 elements, which also have index 0, index 1, and index 2. And what do we need to do? Well, we just need to get the string from index 0 of the strings, and then convert it into an integer. How do we convert it into an integer? We use the integer dot parse int method, right? So we do that for index zero. So what would we say are um, our numbers array at position zero will become assigned to the value of our of our elements array. I just deleted uh, our beautiful artwork. Doesn't matter. So for if, if we j were just doing it for the in uh, for the first element, we'd be doing numbers at position zero. Assign that with elements at position zero, but we can't assign it directly. What did we need to do to convert the string into an integer? We need to integer dot parse int it into an integer. So this is a string, and we're getting an integer from that through integer dot dot parse int. Okay, and that gives us the numbers. Uh, array element at position 0. But we don't need to do that just for element 0, we need to do it for element 1, 2, and for element 2, and for element 3, and so on. So how do we do that? Well, we run a for loop. So we say, start a for loop from 0, continuing up until... Now, both elements and numbers are the same size, but since I'm writing into numbers, I prefer to use their size. So, numbers dot length. Okay, and now we just say, for a single index, it was numbers at position 0 equals element at position uh, 0, and that parsed to an integer. In this case, since i will always uh, be the next index in the array, we just do numbers at position i, assign that with integer dot parse dot parse int of elements at position i. And that's it. We already ha we now have our numbers entered over here. And we can do whatever we wish with them. Just so you see that uh, the input, uh, the reading is correct, let's start um, uh, the code and see in the debugger how the numbers array looks like. And now we'll combine uh, reading an array from a single line on the console with uh, viewing an array in the debugger. Okay, so let's input 13, 42, 255, minus 1, 5. Okay, and press enter. Let's see, it seems that our code reached this part, and now let's see if our array looks correct. So here's our array, we can expand it over here and see its elements. So, oh, I actually expanded the elements array, but that's fine too, let's see them both. So the elements array are the strings 1, 3, 1, 3 4, 2, 2, 5, 5, minus 1, or dash 1, and 5, those are the strings. What did we get in the numbers array? We got the numbers 13, 42, 255, minus 1, and 5. Okay, so we read them correctly. And if we want, we can print them on the console or calculate the sum for them or whatever we want to do. But this is how you read a line of integers from the console. This, These 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 lines do that. Pretty neat, huh? It's a pretty short program for reading something which we haven't yet uh, gotten any practice with. So here is some code which does the same uh, thing. And you can uh, do it with functional programming too. There is the stream API in Java which allows you to uh, do such sequence operations uh, one after another over an array. So how can you do that with a single line of code? Well, you tell uh, Java to convert your items into a stream. Streams are things which can be managed by doing operation on each of their items. And then you say for each of the items where item is this, where I'll use this as the name of the item, parse that item into an integer and use this result and convert that to array. Now, if this seems a bit like dark magic to you currently, it's because it is. So it, it's actually not that complicated, but it's too soon for us to explain fully what this does. However, since you're probably going to see this functionality somewhere on the web and wonder why haven't we shown this to you, well, that's why we're showing this to you. And if someone is interested, he, uh, they can uh, 
study this even further on. But for now, it's completely okay to read with uh, for loops. Actually, I prefer reading with for loops, even though I can use this and I understand how it works. I mostly prefer to read with for loops because it's a bit more explicit on the operations you're doing. You can do it even shorter. You can say create a stream out of the splitting instead of creating a separate variable which you create a stream from you can say arrays dot create a stream from that split which i just got and map each element to an integer how do you map it to an integer by doing to each element an integer dot parsint and convert that back into an array again if that's a bit too weird for you currently don't worry that's normal because we haven't studied uh, the concepts of uh, objects and we haven't even studied methods yet so it's normal for you uh, for you for this to seem weird to you we it, it will get clearer as we go along and you're not obliged to do it but if you're interested see and work out how this works study it online okay let's continue on with the next part of the lecture which will concern ourselves with uh, printing arrays and the different ways we can do that on the console and we'll also solve a few programming problems related to arrays okay so how do we print an array on the console well we already saw some of that uh, let's say we have an array initialized with uh, a few strings, let's say, and we want to print its items. Well, how do we do that? And let's print not just the items, but let's also print the indices of these items. So let's say array and that index is equal to that value. How do we do that? Let's write some code over here. So um, we could use our array, which we just read from the console, but let's not overdo it. So let's just initialize a string array and work on that. So we have a string array and that string array will have items. Let's call them words. And these words are initialized through a string initialization here and we'll place the words hello and then we'll pr place the word world in the array. Okay, so we want to print these words on the console and we have several options to do that. First off, we can do the for loop like we did for uh, the normal integer array, it would be the same, the exact same for the string array of words. Okay, so we start from index zero, we continue until index matches words.length minus one, that's the last position we want to, um, we continue until we reach words.length minus one, meaning that the index should be less than words.length, so the last position we want to match is words.length minus one at the point where we have an i which is equal to words.length we need to stop the loop okay so now what would what do we do well we just print out the word at that index and i also said let's print out the index along with it so let's print a formatted string system dot out dot print f print a formatted string and in that formatted string i want to say that words at position something at position digits so actually let's let's write it simply and then we'll replace whatever we want so words at position i we want to say that that is equal to um to word to yeah so we want to say words at position some position over here is equal to the value at this position so we want to say that words at position for example words of zero equals let's say hello that's what we want to print. So let's say that we want to have words zero equals hello. That's what we want printed for the first element. Okay, so let's generalize this for all elements. So this would print words zero equals hello for all iterations of the loop, but that's not what we want. We want to do this concept, but we want to do it with the specific values of the element at index zero and element at index one and element at index two and so on. Okay, so this won't be words zero, but it will be words, the, uh, the digits of an integer number. What is that integer number going to be? Well, it's going to be the index in that words array. And now we need to just print the word at that position. And since it's a word, it's going to be a string. And that string we print with percent %s. And to place that into the format, we need to access words at that index. So starting this code, oh, and we might want to have a new line at the end. And starting that code, we'll see hello and world on two separate lines. Here we go. Words at position zero is hello. Words at position one is world. Okay. 
So, we just printed out an array of strings on the console. We also saw we can print it out just the words themselves, we can separate them with spaces. Now let's do something, something more interesting. I want us to print, I want us to print each word and I want the words to be separated by spaces. But I don't want the la actually, okay, let's do it like this. I want the words separated by commas. So I have a word and I have a comma and then I have another word and I have another comma and so on. Okay, so how would I do that? Pl printing the words is simple. Let's just print them like this. So starting it like this, we'll just print the words with no separators between them. So I will have hello world attached, concatenated on the output. Okay, so how do we add a comma, you say? Well, one way is to just attach the comma to the printing operation. But this we will not exactly work, right? Because it will print commas between our words, but it will also print a comma at the end. And we don't want that comma at the end. We, we want the end to finish without a comma. We only want commas in between our strings. And by the way, we need a new line at the end so that we can separate our output from the debugger messages, like this one. Okay, so we're printing a line to separate ourselves from this debugger message, but we still have the problem of the comma after the last element. So again, this is somewhat of a debugging challenge. How do we cause our code to only print separators until it reaches the last element? We don't want a comma after the last element. Well, obviously we won't be printing it each time. So we will be printing it under some condition. Under what condition do we print uh, the comma? Well, we want to print only when we are not at the last word. How do we check whether we are at the last word? Well, we say if the index equals words dot length minus one, then we are at the last index, right? So this here is the last index because words.length minus one, the, the last index of an array is always the length of the array minus one. So in this case, we have item zero and item one, element zero and element one, and the total size of these elements is two. So minus one would give us exactly uh, the last index. Okay? And in this case, I would only need to print words at this position. Otherwise, I would print words followed by a comma. And this should work. If I start this code, I will see hello and world separated by a single comma and with no comma after world. So that's fine. But I want to uh, make this code uh, look a bit better. So now I have a lot of repetition. In both cases, I'm printing words at position I. So in both cases, I'm doing this. The only difference is that when I isn't length minus one, I print a comma. So I should kind of reverse this, right? If I'm doing something in both conditional statements, if I'm doing the same thing in both conditional statements, well, that means I'm doing something wrong. That if, if in both in the if and the else I'm doing the same thing, then I probably need to be doing that thing outside of them because whether it's true or not, the, the statement I got into the if, in both cases I'm printing. So let's take this out of the, the condition and what would remain is I'd switch these around. So I'd say if I is less than words.length minus one, meaning that if I'm at any other position, any position other than the last position, I want to print a comma. In all other cases, uh, if I get to the last position, I won't print a comma because if I becomes uh, one, which is the last position here, what will happen? Well, is one less than words.length minus one, words.length minus one, words.length is two, minus one equals one. Is one less than one? Well, no, it isn't. And since it isn't, this comma will not be printed. Okay, so starting the code like this, we will get the same result, but the code looks a bit more understandable. Okay, so that's what our code should do. That's how we print an array of items, separating them with a separator and ensuring that the separator doesn't get to the end uh, of our array. It, it is only between the elements and not after the last element. Okay, so we did that. 
Uh, and that's one of the ways we, in which we can print an, uh, an, a list of integers on the console. Now, here's a task we already solved. We have an array, which is defined on the console as a single integer, fo followed by that number of elements, and we need to print them in reverse. We already did that at the start of this lecture, so we won't repeat this uh, task. The solution which uh, we have over here is pretty much the same one we implemented ourselves. Okay. However, uh, let's see something else. In addition to printing ourselves, if you have a string array, and this only works for string arrays, not for other array types, if you have a string array, instead of coding this all by your own, this uh, printing with separators, you can simply use the string, the built-in string functionality. You can use string.join. Now, string.join accept, accepts uh, one parameter, which is a delimiter, in this case, a comma, in our case, where we wanted to separate them with commas, uh, a delimiter, which is a comma, and the the array of things you, which it needs to join, in this case, our words. So string.join, getting this delimiter and these words, will generate a new string, which we will call comma separated words. So this variable will now contain a string, a, a sequence of symbols, which are separated, which are our words into, converted into symbols and separated by commas. And now we can simply print these comma separated words and see what happens on the console. We will see hello comma world printed on the console just like we did previously. So instead of writing that yourself, if you have an array of strings, well, you can use string.join. Now, if you don't have an array of strings, you can use the code which we implement, implemented a few moments back. Or another option would be, well, what happens if you have a list of no, a, a string of no, um, an array of numbers? Well, you convert it into an array of strings. How do we do that? Let's convert an array of numbers into an array of strings. So let's say we have an int array, which is numbers. And we want to place that into this words array. Okay, so let's say that numbers, for simplicity, we won't be reading it from the console. We'll just initialize it with a new integer array. And we'll place 1, 2, and 3 over here. Okay, and now we want to convert this integer uh, array into a string array. And how would we do that? Well, the way we do that is... Uh, go through all of the items in the numbers array and place them in the matching positions in the strings array. So first we need to initialize the strings array uh, with that appropriate amount of elements. So we'd say numbers.length, initialize the string array with numbers.length. And from here, we just need to loop through the words array. So I'd say start from index zero, continue until you reach words.length. And at each position in words, place the number from numbers. Okay, so we can't do this directly because numbers is an integer array and words is a string array. So we're trying to, write, to uh, put an integer in the place of a string, but that's uh, something which, for which we have an easy conversion. Just like we have integer.parsint, which converts an integer into a, a string into an integer, well, the same way we have string dot value of, and we supply it with an integer number or something else, and that converts it into a string and saves it into words. So now let's print these numbers on the console separated by a comma using this functionality. And we got one, two, and three printed on the console with commas. Great. So we have that implemented now and we can we have another way of printing to the console. Just convert your numbers uh, uh, array into a strings array by copying the items using string.value of, and then just use string.join to join them. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to this approach. Of course, to do all of this, we need to have an entire string array, which we need to print. Whereas if we just iterate the numbers and use the code we wrote a few moments ago, which manually separates them by a delimiter, well, in that case, we wouldn't need to allocate a new string uh, array, and that would use up a bit less memory. But if you're not uh, concerned about memory in the program you're writing, this is a completely fine solution. 
Okay, so uh, I just showed you string.join. By the way, you can also join by nothing. If you leave this as an empty string, well, that would just concatenate these strings which you uh, entered. So instead of one, two, three with commas, you would just receive one, two, three as a sequence of characters. Okay, so that's another way in which you can print arrays to the console. Now, we have another uh, interesting uh, task over here. We need to reverse an array of elements, but instead of just printing them reversed, now up to this point we were printing reversed when we were reversing, in this situation we want to reverse the array itself, so we need to exchange the items inside the array, like so, like it's demonstrated over here. We need to exchange the last item with the first item, the second item with the second last item, and so on. Okay, how do we do that? Well, there are a few ways we can achieve that. Well, the easier way is to just create another array and start from the last index of the first array and copy into the first index of the second array. And so you're copying in reverse. That's one way of doing it, but let's not cop out like that and actually swap the items in place. This is called an in-place algorithm. What does in-place mean? It means that it works in the place it has begun, meaning that starting it on an array of strings will reverse that array, not create a new array, meaning it won't uh, need more memory than is needed for the input. Okay, so let's say we have these words again. Uh, it doesn't really matter how we get them. Let's say we get them from these num. Okay, let, let's actually initialize these words as uh, input from the console since it's good to practice our reading of arrays. So let's say we have a list of strings from the console on a single line and we need to read them into an ar array of strings. How did we do that? Well, we used scanner.nextline to get the entire line of strings and then we split that by spaces because that's our separator here, spaces. Split that by spaces and receive our array of strings. So this is a string array and let's call it we can call it strings, it's not necessarily words, it could be symbols. So we have our strings array over here. And now all we need to do is walk that strings array and swap out indexes. Okay, so let's leave the printing logic over here. So we're printing strings, comma separated words isn't really accurate anymore. So let's just inline that variable meaning let's remove the variable and just place the expression we just used wherever we need the printing to happen and we need to print them with a space okay now now the current code will just read strings from a, from a line on the console split them into spaces and then print them joined by spaces again we need to swap around these items in such a way that the last items be become the first items Okay, so how would we do that? Obviously, we need a for loop. So we need to be accessing elements inside the array. And each of these elements we need to do something with. What are we going to do with each of these elements? And for how many elements are we going to do it? Let's uh, take a look at the slides again. So what do we need to do? We need to exchange the first item with the last item and then the second item with the second last item. And how many times do we need to exchange? Well, since each time we're touching two elements, that means that we only need to do as many operations as there are elements divided by two, since each time we're uh, playing with two elements. So if we have five elements, one, two, three, four, and five, how do we exchange these? Well, we exchange one and five, and then we exchange two and four, and that's it. We don't need to exchange anymore, because if we continue exchanging, we reverse it again. So we only need to continue until we reach index uh, the index that is the number of elements divided by two. So if we have four items, how does that look like? One, two, three, and four. Well, it's again, we exchange two and three and we exchange one and four. If we have four items, one, two, three, four, five, uh, we, if we have five items, I meant, we exchange one with five, two with four, and that's it. So in both cases, we reach index two, meaning actually we reach index one, because index two is the index we shouldn't be reaching. This is index two here, this is index two here. So in both cases, our loop runs from zero up until 
it reaches the index before index 2. So 0, 1, and we stop at 2. And 0, 1 here, and we stop at 2 again. Okay, so whether it's an even number of uh, items or an uneven number, an odd number of items, we, in both cases, uh, go until we reach the dot length divided by 2, and we need to reach before this, so less than this. Okay, so we need a for loop that goes from 0 to strings dot length divided by 2, and now we just do what? We need to exchange two indices. Which are these indices? Okay, so the first index we need to exchange is just index i, whatever index we're at currently. So index 0, index 1, index 2, index 3, index 4. So i becomes index 0, and this is the first index we need to exchange. And we, to, we need to exchange it with which index? Well, index 0 we need to exchange with index 4. What is index 4 expressed through the variables we have? Well, index 4 is strings dot length minus 1, right? That's index 4 in our case. Okay, what happens when i becomes 1? So i becomes 1, pointing at the character b. Which index do we need to exchange that with? Well, we need to exchange it with index 3. What is index 3 display, uh, uh, described as uh, variables which we have? Well, strings dot length minus 1 and then minus 1 again, right? So string dot length minus 1 is the last item and strings dot length minus 1 and again minus 1 is the next element but what is 1? Well, 1 is i, right? So i is index 1 and this is what we're using over here. And if you think about the first index, well, here we also have minus i, but it's minus zero because i is zero the first time around. So what's the formula for the opposite index on the other side of the array? It's just int, um, let's just say that this is the left index and this is the right index. So the right index is what? It's strings dot length minus one that gives us the last element and then we need to offset it as much as i is offset from the start so if i is offset from the start by zero we will offset it by zero and then if it's offset from the start by one we will offset it by one run this formula around in your head do a few calculations with it and you'll see what happens you'll see that this provides the exact indexes we need okay so we have the left index and we have the right index and we need to swap them around. How do we swap around two variables? Well, you probably know by now that to swap around two variables, you need a third variable in which to so store one of the two because you'd be overwriting one of those two and you would need to um, use the swapping variable to overwrite that one to the other value. So simply said, if you have a bottle, I know that's a weird bottle, bear with me. So let's say you have a bottle of water and you have a bottle of tea. Let's even give it a bit of color. Now I know this doesn't look like tea, but bear with me, please. Okay, so you have a bottle of water and you have a bottle of tea. Let's say that, let's indicate that this is water. Okay, so a bottle of water and a bottle of tea. In order to exchange them, well, you can't just pour the water into the tea or vice versa because you'd mix them. Okay, what you need to do is grab another bottle so grab, let's say, this bottle all over here, which is empty, it doesn't contain anything, and move the contents of the water bottle into the green bottle, then move the blue bottle's contents into the red bottle, so the, the previous water bottle's contents are now filled with the yellow of the tea, and now this green bottle, which got the red bottle's water, needs to be moved inside the blue bottle. So you need a third variable. How do we do that? Well, let's create the third variable string and let's say this is old left, the previous value of left, and we'll assign that to strings from the position, we'll assign that to the string at position left index in the strings array. Okay, so old left is strings give me the position at left index. Okay, so that's old left. And now what do we do with the left index? Well, we just say strings at the left index should be assigned with the value of strings with, at the right index. So right index of strings. Okay, and now we just need to, we now have 
whatever was at the right index, we have it at the left index. And now we just need to set the right index to contain what was previously at the left index. So strings right index assign that with the value with the old value of the left index. And that's it. We've just swapped around our lists. Let's see what uh, we're, we're going to get if we're uh, if we have any errors here. Okay, so we're running this. And let's say we want to input. Um, let's input a let's input the input we had in the presentation a b c d e and let's see if it switches down around yes it does and now we should try out with um, an even number of values because that's where we could have a mistake okay let's go with one two three four and see okay that uh, converted it into four three two one okay so we solved that issue and the code over here is pretty much the uh, value with uh, the code which we had in our case and you can check it and try to implement it yourselves. Okay, let's continue with the last part of the lecture in which we will see another for loop. Now we already talked about loops in a previous lesson, however, this is a new type of loop which is strictly related to arrays or other types of sequences of elements and we will study about other types of sequences further on. So this loop is the so-called for each loop. The for each loop or sometimes called the range based for loop uh, or the for in loop is a loop which is specifically created to iterate through collections. What does that mean? That means that instead of writing uh, loops which traverse an array by indexes, uh, what you can do is create a for each loop which goes through all of the elements inside that array without needing to reference the index, it only references the item itself. So how does that work? Well, it works by providing you an element at each iteration, but not providing you an index. So you only have access to the element itself, but not the current index. Okay. It's a read only loop, meaning that you can't actually edit the items inside the array. We'll show that in a bit. And it looks like this. You type in for just like you would for a normal for loop. But after that, you specify the collection you want to iterate, like for example, an array, you prefix that with a column and you say that you want to iterate each item inside that collection. And you can use var instead of writing the type name of uh, whatever you have in the collection, or you can just write, if you have a collection of integers, you just write int item. So this says at each iteration, you will be supplied with an item variable, which will be the next item in that array or collection. So let's do that in our code. So here we had a printing of strings on the console with a space. Actually, let's get rid of that one. And let's just initialize a normal array of strings and test on with that. So here's our array of strings. We'll initialize it with a new string array containing the, wor the words hello and arrays because we're talking about arrays today. Okay, so we have our strings array. Now, normally we do a for loop starting from index zero, reaching up to strings dot length and actually not reaching that index, not executing for that index. So I being less than, less than strings dot length. And then what do we do? Well, we start printing, for example, our strings. Let's say we do system dot out dot print line, the string at that position, so strings at position I. And just so we make this a bit more clearer, strings at position I, we can assign to a variable, which we can call item. So we get the current item from strings by accessing that index in strings, and then we print that item. The exact same result we will get if we do a for each loop. How do we do a for each loop? We type in for, we open the brackets, and we say, what type of data do we have in our strings array? We, well, we have strings. So we, can, we have the string item inside our strings array, and for this item, we can do system.out.println item. That's it. That's the range based for loop. That's the for each loop. The for each loop is just a shorthand for an iteration of items inside a collection, 
whether it be a uh, list of strings collection or an array of strings collection or a linked list or a, a lot of other collections we will be studying can be iterated through this for each loop. Okay, so what effectively happens? Well, effectively, this loop just goes through the indexes in this array when it's executed for an array and it gives our gives us an item variable which we can access to print it we can name it however we want we can name it s if we want to but i named it item so i match this string item variable over here so this loop and this loop are pretty much equivalent currently let's get back to the item name this for each loop and this for loop are pretty much equivalent they they have the same effect as in sequence of handling of elements and they have the same result printed out to the console. So both of these will print hello and erase on the console. Let's see them in action. We'll wait a bit. And here we go. We have hello and we have erase on the next line. And then we have hello again and we have erase again on the next line. Okay, so that's what the range based for loop looks like. Now, what you don't have access to here, as you notice, is the index. We can't access uh, which index we are located at currently. So you don't know whether item is the first item or the second item or the third item or whatever. So you only use this range based for loop if you just want to go through all of the elements in a sequence and, and do that. If you want to do something specific like swapping around elements or assigning new values to elements and so on, that's something you need to uh, have a normal for loop to do. Okay, so saying that, can we actually use the index even though we, we don't have access to the index? Let, let's try to use the index regardless. So how can we print at which index we're located current? I want to print the following thing. I want to print 0.hello and 1.arrays formatted like this. This is what I want output on the console. So how would I do that with a range based for loop with the for each loop? Well, let's remove the old for loop. Well, I might not have the index directly, but what's to stop me from creating an integer variable, calling it index, starting it from zero, and incrementing it where? Where does the for loop increment its index? At the end of the body, correct? So let's do the same. Let's increment the index at the end of the body. And now all we need to do is just go over here and print the index, then followed by a dot and followed by the item. Now if I start this code, I will get 0.hello and 1.arrays. Here we go. So I can still use an index, but I need to code that index myself. Okay, so let's add a space here so we see what, uh, let's see the formatting a bit better uh, rendered. Yeah, we, this is what we wanted initially when we said we want uh, to have a prefix of the index. So yeah, zero dot uh, space and the item. That's what we printed that how did we do it we just used an index variable which was external to our for loop and yeah this index variable is visible outside of the for loop and can be used outside of the for loop but we don't really uh, care about uh, this in our current program uh, what we care about is the fact that we managed to get the index of the current element now not all collections will have such a thing as an index but you can still count up to which item you've reached. You can count how many items you have in your uh, array of strings, for example. Okay, so that's one thing you can do with, with uh, for each loop. Now, what you can't do with the for each loop is say item, assign that to, for example, uh, a sequence of dots. So doing this, yeah, the code will compile. It will run. Let's see what happens. So I'm assigning the item to a sequence of dots. And on the output, yeah, I, I actually do see that I'm outputting sequences of dots. Uh, does that mean that I just lied to you and that I can actually change the item? Well, not exactly. Meaning if I now iterate these strings again, so I'll add the same for each loop, but I won't be changing anything. I'll just say strings 
So I don't need to write the for each loop. I will just uh, ask IntelliJ to do it for me. So I write strings. I press Alt and Enter, and I say iterate, and it generates the for each loop for me. So for each item in strings, print that item. I won't need the index. Let's ignore the index, and actually let's ignore that index from the previous code as well, so it, so it doesn't uh, mess with our thinking about what's happening. Okay, so we just we're just printing the items, but in the first loop we're assigning values to these items, whereas on the second loop we're just printing them. So what would we expect to see? Well, if this actually changes the items in the strings array, then the second printing should still print the dots, right? Not the words. Let's see what happens, however. What you're going to see is that the items remain what they were. So we're not actually changing them. All we're changing is the current, let's say, copy of the item. So each time you uh, create a for each loop like this, you're actually receiving uh, another name for the item. You're receiving another variable which indicates the, the same item and strings. But if you change the entire var variable, you're not changing the string itself in the strings, you're changing the new variable. So you get a new variable that points to this string the first time. And if you tell that variable to point to something else, because assignment of strings and of other objects doesn't, um, doesn't override the existing object, it just overrides the variable which points to it. And that variable now stops pointing to hello and starts pointing to this string, to the string dots. And if we iterate it again and not mess with the variable, it will still point to whatever it was supposed to point. So here we're not changing the item itself, we're just changing, uh, imagine in this for each loop, on each iteration, we just receive, um, let's say that this is a, um, this is a apartment and we're walking through apartments and we're visiting the first apartment and then we're visiting the second apartment and so on. So to, in order to visit the apartment, we need to know the address of the apartment. So by doing a for each loop like this, what we're actually doing is receiving an address, you know, like uh, uh, first Broadway street or something. So we're receiving first Broadway street and we're visiting that first Broadway street. And this first Broadway street, we're receiving it written on a piece of paper. So this is our piece of paper. It's not the apartment itself. It's just a piece of paper, which has information about where that apartment is located. So this variable is just something that contains information by which Java finds where the actual object is located in memory. And if we take that uh, sheet of paper and just scribble something on it, we won't change the apartment itself. We won't change the apartment. We're just changing the sheet of paper's address and it will point to something else. And if we try to visit that something else, well, we will see something else. But we didn't actually move the apartment. We just received a copy of the address, like we received um, we received a card, a business card, which indicates the address. If we scribble something on that card, that's our problem. The, the person which gave us the business card still has another business card and still has their address. So we didn't change the address itself. We just changed what was written on the business card. So by changing the business card and printing it, yeah, we we printed something else because we scribbled on the business card, but the original business's uh, owner still has their apartment and still has other business cards which, which they can hand out. And if someone else visits the actual business card uh, addresses, they will see the actual apartments. Whereas I am seeing something different than the actual apartments. I'm seeing whatever I scribbled on the business cards. So. Editing the item inside the for each loop doesn't actually edit the item inside the array. Here you're just receiving, you can think of it like receiving a copy of the item. So the for each loop receives copy of the items. A copy isn't exactly the correct description uh, in the long term, but for now it's a good way of understanding it. Imagine that you're receiving a copy of the string. Okay, and, and iterating it like this will just print that copy of the string. Okay. In reality, it's, it's a variable which points to the same string, but you're not changing the same string with by assigning a variable because assigning a variable just changes to what the variable points. So instead of that variable pointing to hello, it will begin to point to this new string object I just created. Okay, so that's uh, 
pretty much all you need to know about this for each loop. You can't edit items inside it. You just forget about doing that. Okay, and we now have um, an example of printing the a list of numbers with the for each loop. I showed you how to uh, do printing strings, so it's pretty much the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's strings or numbers or floats or doubles or booleans or whatever. Okay, so we have a task over here. We have a problem which we need to solve. We have an array of integers which is going to be entered on a single line on the console and we need to sum all even on and all odd numbers. So we need to we're only caring about the elements right now, right? We don't care about the indices of those elements. We only care what type of element we have, whether we have an odd number or an even number, okay? And then we need to find the difference between the even sum and the odd sum. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we have an input of a line of numbers. Let's read that input of a line of numbers. So we can directly use our strings array, but instead of uh, initializing it ourselves, we will read it from the scanner through the next line method and, and we will split it by spaces. Okay, so now we will get the numbers, but represented as strings in an array of strings. And now we need to convert that, that array of strings into an array of integers. So here are our numbers, and we will initialize these numbers with a new int initialized by the strings.length. Okay, and now what do we do? Well, we need to copy these strings from here into our numbers. So we need to start a for loop from index 0 to index numbers.length minus 1 effectively. And we need to set the numbers arrays position i to the value of strings at position i, but we need to parse it into an integer. Integer.parseInt of that strings at i element. Okay, so we, this is how we get the element. And now what do we do? Well, we have the numbers and we have to calculate the sum of the even numbers and the sum of the odd numbers. Well, since we're calculating both of these values, we need an integer even sum, which starts from zero, and we need an integer odd sum, which starts from zero. Okay, and now what do we need? We need to iterate each item in this array check if that item is even or odd, and add it into the appropriate sum. So how do we do that? Well, we just start a for each loop, since we don't care about the index, and every time we don't care about the index, we don't really want a, a normal for loop. It's easy to make a mistake with the indexes in the for loop, but it's not easy to make a mistake with the for each loop, because there's not much you can make a mistake with. So let's do a for each loop. So numbers, I mention, I, I type in the name of the collection I want to iterate and then I press Alt and Enter and then I pick Iterate and it generates a for each loop which walks through each number in the numbers and what I need to do is if that number is divisible by 2 with a remainder of 0 so I have no remainder when dividing this number by 2 then I need to add it where? Into the even sum. I need to add that number into the even sum. Otherwise, there are no other cases except that remainder being 1. So if the remainder is 1, I'd add it to the odd sum. Okay, and I just now need to print the difference between these. Okay, so for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I should get the result 3. Why do I get the result 3? Well, because I have um, the number 1 is odd, 3 is odd, 5 is odd, so I get eight from that and I have the even numbers are two, four and six and I get two and four six and six is twelve and I subtract ah, okay I'm not uh, my calculations are wrong this isn't eight three and five is eight so three and five equals eight and one more equals nine so this is nine and the sum of the even numbers is twelve and the difference is between even and odd, so I need to subtract odd from even and I'd get 3. Okay, let's see if that works. Uh, I need to print on the console system.out.println even minus odd. Okay, and now start this and I'll see what happens. I will copy the input from these examples and test it out in this um, in the console. So for this input, we received three, that seems correct. Okay, 
we should receive minus 35 for this. Let's check with a negative value. So with a negative result pasting this minus 35. Okay, so now I should test around with the other inputs. Uh, so, so that I can be sure that my program is working correctly, but I will not I will not be playing around with that currently. I will just continue on with the lecture. My advice is again, solve this task by yourself and try to um, try to test with different inputs and see how you can implement it in another way. Maybe implement this task with a normal for loop, see how that changes things and so on. Okay, so here in the solution which were provided, we have reading of the input through a stream. You can play around with this one too, uh, instead of using my uh, approach of reading from the console, uh, reading from the console with the for loop, or you can continue with using, uh, or you, you could do this approach, you could do my approach of just uh, parsing items one by one, both of the approaches will be uh, fine enough at this point of the course. And from here on out, it's pretty much whatever we uh, wrote a few moments ago. Okay, so before we reach the summary, let's do one more thing. So let before we reach the end of this lecture, let's do uh, some nested iteration of our numbers. So let's uh, solve the following task. Uh, we need to find the, the smallest difference possible between two numbers in the array. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, for our array of 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11, the smallest difference, and that's kind of a boring uh, example because all of the differences are 2. Between 3 and 5, it's 2. Between 5 and 7, it's 2. And 7 and 9 is 2. And 9 and 11 is 2. Uh, and all other differences are... Uh, you know, are, are larger. We need to find the smallest difference. Okay, let's pick some of this data. Eh, all of this data is kind of boring. Okay, let's figure out our own data. So let's use this as an example. We have the array which contains the items 7, 1, 13, 5, um, 2, uh, 33. So we need to find the smallest difference between two numbers in this array, but not consecutive numbers any two numbers in this array. So any two numbers which aren't the same number. So we check, we need to check, how, how do we check this? We, well, we obviously need to check every number with every other number. So what we do is check this number with this number, and then we check again this number with the number 13, and then check this number with the number two, and then check this number with the number 33, and so on. And then we do the same for the uh, for number one, then we do the same for number 13, the same for number two, and then no need to do it for number 33 since it doesn't have another number with it. So actually, how do we do it? We do the checks with seven and one, then we do the check of 7 and 13, then we do the check of 7 and 2, then we do the check of 7 and 33. Okay, and for the number 1, do we need to check back as 1 and 7? Well, no, we're looking for the smallest absolute difference, so we're not, we don't need to recombine them the other way around. So instead of checking 1 with 7, we'll just check 1 with 13 directly. So 1 with 13, then 1 with 2, then one with 33 and that's it. And then for 13, we'll check 13 with two and 13 with 33. And then for two, we'll check just two and 33. So these are the checks we need to do. So for each number in this array, we're comparing it with each number after it. And we're looking for the minimum difference. Okay, since we're looking for a minimum difference, uh, what do we need to, what do we need to create? Now, first off, this is a standard, part of this is a standard uh, task in programming, find the minimum. So we're searching for the minimum, but it's not the minimum element, it's the minimum difference. So since we're searching for a minimum, let's create that minimum. So we're searching for a minimum. We'll call it min diff, min difference. How will we initialize that min difference? Well. I do the following. I'd assume that the difference between the first and the second element is the minimum difference. 
If it isn't, I'll prove that by iterating the elements. So I'll replace that. But initially, I'll start with the difference between the first two elements. And I'll have a requirement that my array of strings has at least two elements. Otherwise, it's not really, uh, it, there's nothing to search a minimum difference for. If, if we have an array of just one element or zero elements, that's also possible, by the way. If we search for uh, the minimum difference in an array of one element, well, we can't make a pair of elements for for which we need to find the difference. So yeah, that doesn't work. Okay, so the minimum difference is mat.absolute value and mat.absolute value of the difference between numbers at position one and numbers at position zero. I can swap them around if uh, it would be easier to read. So number zero minus numbers one, it doesn't really matter since we're calculating the absolute value. Okay, and I need to print this. And you're saying, okay, but you haven't calculated everything. Yeah, I haven't, but I like to frame my program program like this. I need to, uh, I, I like to initialize whatever I'm going to be calculating and then print it. And then somewhere in between, I need to implement my code, which does the work. Okay, so how do I do this work? Well, I need to start for each element in this, uh, for, for each element, in this array, except the last element. So I need to do it for the first element, the second element, the third element and the fourth element, but not for the fifth element. So for each element, except the last, for each element, except the last index, which means that could I use a for each loop? The for each loop always iterates all elements, but I don't want the last element. So I'll be using a normal for loop. Okay, so for each element in these elements, I need to check it with all of the other elements in the list. So let's do the first part for each element. What I'm going to be doing for each element, I'll figure out afterwards. Okay, so, so I'll start a new for loop starting from zero and continuing until numbers dot length minus one, right? We don't want the last index. That's why we'll do it. we're doing a minus one over here. So we don't reach this index, which is minus one. Okay, so uh, for each element, I need to look at all the other elements. So in order for me to check all the other elements uh, with seven, well, I need to write another for loop because this is exactly what I did when I was writing this out. So I picked seven and I started seven with one and then seven with 13 and then seven with two and then seven with 33. So each element after our current elements index, I need to visit. Okay, so what I need to do is start another for loop and now I can't really use for i because i is already used for the first loop. So I call this index now IntelliJ suggests j because that's just the next word the next letter. I'd avoid using i and j in nested loops. Why? Well because they look too much alike and it's easy to confuse them with one another. So I'll instead call this the compare index because that's what I'm doing. I will be comparing with that element. So the compare index continues up until where? It continues up until numbers dot length, not dot length minus one, because I want to compare seven with 33. I just don't want to compare 33 by itself with anything. Okay. And what do I check now? Well, I'll check the difference between my current number and this index. So I'd say that the current difference is equal to mat.apps calculate the absolute value of the difference between numbers my index on which I have started, meaning that first time that's going to be seven, the index from which I've started and numbers, the index with which I'm comparing. So this is my current difference. Okay, so now I have, uh, I've walked these, uh, this array, I've walked each of its elements and for each of its elements, I've walked all of the other elements. And actually, have I walked all of the other elements? From which index do I need to start? Well, I need to start from the index after my index, after my current index. Look, I'm comparing seven with one, not with itself, not with index zero. And then I'm comparing seven with 13 and further on, I'm comparing, um, uh, yeah, I'm comparing two with 33 and only with that I'm not comparing any of the previous indexes. Okay, so 
this isn't correct over here. I should start not from zero, but from what is my current, what is my base element which, with which I'm comparing it's at index i. So I need to start from index i plus one. Okay, so this is my current difference. And from here on out, it's just searching for a minimum element. So this is the current element and this is the minimum, the current minimum. So when do I need to change the current minimum? Well, if the current difference is less than the current minimum, then the current minimum will become the current difference. And that's it. And I print the current difference here. Let's check if this works. So for these, the, the minimum difference seems to be between one and two, and that should be one. Let's see if that's true. We paste that code and we get one. Again, we should test around uh, this code with other values, other uh, orderings of these values, maybe with an array of only two elements, with an array of a lot of elements, with an array of elements which are all of equal value and so on. So we can test whether it really works, but I'll leave that to you and I'll leave debugging any issues uh, that remain from here up to you. Again, this is bonus homework. If you want to really ramp up your programming skills, a lot of the work done on arrays is actually of this type. You're not only iterating them, you're iterating each, for each element, you're iterating the array again, or another array again. Okay, so what did we learn today? We learned that arrays hold sequences of elements, and they allow us to allocate uh, programmable amounts of memory, meaning we can say how much memory we, will, we want to allocate it. Uh, it. They allow us to programmatically access elements of that array, meaning we can use a for loop or another method of computing an index and then accessing the element at that index, which is an extremely powerful tool because we don't need to know the names of the uh, indexes. We, need ju we just need to be able to calculate those indexes, what they are. Okay, we saw how we can allocate an array and we saw how we can access elements of that array and we saw we how we can read elements from the console uh, for an array and how we can print elements on the console through the string.join method if they're strings or through a for loop which just prints the elements. And we also saw the for each loop and we solved a lot of programming puzzles uh, and the last one of which was a pure bonus which we have weren't, uh, um, weren't considering initially for this lesson but uh, bonus knowledge is always bonus knowledge, so I hope uh, you found this useful. Again, if you have any questions, please ask them in all the channels we've provided for asking questions, and I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Did you like this lesson? Do you want more? Join the Werner's community at softunit.org. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to get more free video tutorials on coding and software development. Get free access to the practical exercises and the automated judge system for this coding lesson and many others. Get free help from mentors and meet other learners. Join now, it's free. Softuni.org